Okay, in this uh, uh, video, we're going to introduce the concept of impedance matching or how we uh, reduce reflections of power that come back to, let's say, a generator or a source. And so to set the scene, let's consider a problem like this. Um, let's say you're designing an antenna for a radar, right? And you've got to deliver power to that antenna as efficiently as possible. If you're putting a kilowatt on that line, you want all that kilowatt to end up on the antenna and none of it to be wasted, none of it to reflect back and forth. Two reasons, number one, is of course you wanna have the most efficient trans, uh, um, transfer of that power. The second is your generator may well be damaged if you have reflected power that comes back to your generator. Now when you're designing an antenna, um, if you go on and take uh, um, 4370, the uh, uh, radar class, uh, you'll find that there's a certain impedance associated with certain types of antennas, um, a resistance, a capacitance, um, and you have very little control over that once you've designed an antenna. Um, and, uh, you know, most antennas probably have some capacitance to it and, and maybe some resistance as well. Uh, but that's sort of what you're stuck with as far as the load impedance goes. And so, number one, because there's a capacitance on this antenna, you have no hope of having a perfect match if you just have a transmission line, right? You have some control over the impedance of the transmission line. Um, but number one, you only have control over a certain range of values. Like let's say, for example, you know, this antenna may have a 200 ohm uh, impedance to it. Uh, you, it will be very difficult to design a transmission line that carries power to it that has a 200 ohm impedance. Um, that would maybe require ridiculous geometry, a really big line, and you just can't do that. So you have a very limited ability to actually force your, your line impedance to match your load in general. So what do you do in a scenario like that where you uh, have to find some way to match the antenna, but you don't have that control over the transmission line impedance or over the load impedance? So that's what we're gonna talk about in this video is the ways in which you might achieve this match, um, at least for the sinusoidal steady state conditions where you have single frequency. All right, so the first technique is um, uh, going to be called quarter wave matching. And for that, let's consider this scenario. We've got a transmission line here. It's got impedance C0. I think of this as the line that carries power out to your radar antenna. And you've got your load that has a resistance uh, dominated value of RL. Let's, let's say this particular load does not have much Re reactants to it. It's, it's pretty close to, to uh, resistive. Uh, and we don't have control over RL. So the, the assumption is that RL is not equal to Z0, and there's no way we can change that. We're stuck with that, right? Now, if we just connect this, of course, we're going to get reflections back on the load. We're going to get a uh, reflection coefficient that equals RL minus C0 over RL plus C0. That will be non-zero. And if it's big enough, that could well damage the, the transmitter that's that's sending power out toward this load. And so the first technique we're gonna, we're gonna talk about is called quarter wave matching. And the way that's gonna work is we're gonna add a stub at the end of this transmission line. Uh, this stub is gonna have an impedance value that we'll call Z1. And it's that value is gonna connect to RL. And this second transmission line here, this stub Z1 is gonna connect directly to line Z0. So it's a little bit like you're extending the end of your transmission line, um, but making it a new value. Now, one critical thing is that this stub right here is going to be exactly one fourth of a wavelength long, all right? And what we're interested in is this input impedance right here. All right, let's consider this input impedance at this branch looking into the load, okay? And so our goal is to ensure that Z in equals Z zero, because if Z in, the input impedance at this junction looking toward the load equals Z zero, that will imply no reflections. And that's what we're looking for, okay? So how can we set this up? Is there a value of Z1 that would make this work, right? And it's a little bit counterintuitive because uh, no matter what we do, uh, Z1 is also not gonna be equal to, to, to RL. 
So what reason do we have to expect that we're gonna have an answer here um, that works? Uh, and so what I wanna start with is by saying that um, our goal is to ensure that there's a match, that there is only positive going waves over here and there are no negative going waves. These don't exist. But within this stub Z1, we have no such requirement. It's perfectly fine if we have a standing wave on line one, but not on Z0. All right. And this works out to be the following. If Z1 equals the square root of Z0 times RL, then we have no reflections. Assuming that this line is a quarter length, a quarter length long, then we have no reflections. All right, I'm gonna prove this to you briefly because this input impedance C in is exactly a quarter wavelength away from the load. And remember that the Z in for the quarter wavelength point had a special value to it. It was Z zero squared over ZL. And so let's examine that for a second. That is the second. Yeah, uh, Z zero squared over ZL. So let's examine that for a second. Um, in this case, the Z zero is the line that connects to the load. So instead of a Z zero, this actually is gonna be Z one because it's the um, impedance of the first line, the one that uh, that's in between the load and this quarter wave point. And so Z one, we've defined a square root of Z zero times RL. So if we square that, then this is Z zero times RL divided by um, ZL in this case, our load is only resistive, so we can replace ZL with an RL. And of course, this equals Z0. So the input impedance at this, at this juncture, looking toward the load, is precisely equal to our initial, our main transmission line impedance Z0. And that means we get a perfect match. And what I mean by a perfect match is, again, there is no wave that will come back toward the source. But there will be a standing wave in this quarter wave stub. All right, now let's actually see this graphically with uh, um, with this wind TLS simulator. Hang on just a second. All right, we're gonna set the source to be a sine wave. We're gonna go to a uh, cascaded line, so we have two different transmission lines. And let's set this middle impedance to be 100, the load to be 200, and the line to be 50. Right, this matches the condition that the transmission, the impedance of the stub equals the square root of the main transmission line impedance with the load resistance. Another way to say it is that uh, the stub impedance is basically like the, 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 the logarithmic halfway point. So you notice that 200 ohms is double 100 ohms and 100 ohms is double 50 ohms. That's what, that's what you call a geometric mean where the, the ratios of A to B and B to C are the same. And if this stub line is right at that geometric mean, we're gonna get this matching condition if the stub is a quarter wave long. All right, now I'm gonna have to play with this uh, um, advanced parameters for a second. So I'm gonna click on advanced right here. And this uh, um, frequency right here, I'm gonna click this and I'm gonna check set the cycles per second to be 4.5, or cycles per line length to be 4.5. The purpose of that is to make sure that this line is exactly a quarter wavelength long, um, or, or it's actually in this case, two and a quarter wavelengths long. All right, so now, uh, I'm going to simulate this, and let's speed this up. All right. Now, again, uh, this line length right here is two and a quarter wavelength long. The entire transmission line is 4.5 wavelengths, and so this half is two and a quarter wavelengths. Uh, now, bear in mind that 
in our little cycle of repeating input impedances, we looped around every half a wavelength. What that means is that 2.25 wavelengths is the same as 1.75 wavelengths, which is the same as 1.25 wavelengths, et cetera, which is the same as a quarter wavelength. So even though the second half of this wave is um, 2.25 wavelengths long, it's still a good quarter wave match, right? All you basically need to do is, um, is go to an odd multiple of, uh, um, of a quarter wavelength. All right, so here we go. Um, this is all settled out. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the envelope button just so you can verify exactly what's going on here. If you are standing in this main part of the transmission line and you are measuring the standing wave ratio, you would notice that the voltage is not changing at all with length. This is not a standing wave at all. This is a purely propagating wave. So clearly there is a match that has worked, right? There is nothing that's propagating back toward the source. Within the stub, however, it's a different story. Uh, there clearly is a mix of standing wave and propagating wave. So this is not intended to match things everywhere, but it's intended to match things so that things do not go back to the source. And again, this trick of quarter wave matching works specifically when the line is a quarter wavelength or three quarters wavelength or 1.25 wavelengths onwards. And when the impedance of this stub is the harmonic my, harmonic mean, sorry, geometric mean of the load resistance and the line resistance. And this technique, again, is called quarter wave matching. All right, so it's a neat trick. Now, this is not going to give us everything that we want. There are two limitations to it. I'm going to talk about the first one, and then I'll talk about the second one. The first limitation is that this is only going to work technically at one single frequency, right? Why is it only gonna work on one frequency? Because this transmission line, I've told you that we need to design it to be a quarter wavelength long. So that means if our wavelength is, let's say a meter, then this stub right here is gonna be a quarter of a meter or 25 centimeters, right? But that wavelength of a meter is defined at a specific frequency. So let's say this radar is operating in a gigahertz. So this match works perfectly at a gigahertz. However, the moment that we add some bandwidth to the signal, let's say we're, we're oscillating between 910, 990 megahertz and uh, 1.01 gigahertz, right? We oscillate back and forth. As we do that, the wavelength changes, which means that 25 centimeter line is no longer a quarter wavelength. It's now varies a little bit, right? It could be maybe two. 0.24 wavelengths or 0.26 wavelengths. And then we don't quite have the perfect mass that we intended. So if we wanna characterize this, we can consider how the standing wave ratio, the voltage standing wave ratio varies with frequency. And we'll probably observe something like this. In a perfect match, we expect the visoire to be one. So let's say, our center frequency is right here. This is the midpoint of where our radar is operating. But the moment you go outside that exact center frequency, uh, you no longer get a perfect match. So the visoire may well look something like this. And there's a bandwidth associated with that. So then you ask the question, how much reflection can you really tolerate? Uh, convert that to a visoire, maybe it comes up to being here. And now you've got a bandwidth over which you can operate and you're sort of stuck within these two points right here. All right, so this is a bandwidth. So again, this only works uh, in principle at one frequency. The moment you establish a bandwidth, you're allowing the reflection coefficient to vary a little bit and you won't get a perfect match, um, but it will work over some range of frequencies. All right, so that's the first limitation to this technique. The second limitation is that this, this only works if your load is a perfect resistor. If your load, has either inductance or capacitance along with the resistance, then there will not be an answer that's going to work, right? Because this uh, Z1 equals square root of Z0 RL, uh, Z1 is going to be a real number strictly, um, at least at this point. And so if RL also has an imaginary component, right? If we replace RL with ZL and allow ZL to include some impedance from inductors or capacitors, then Z1 is gonna be a complex number and we haven't encountered that yet. 
So this only works if your load is a resistor. Uh, so we need something else that's gonna work for other scenarios. And so let me show you a couple of these tricks. Uh, the next trick I'm gonna show you is called shunt matching. And shunt matching works in the following way. Here's our main transmission line, Z0. And we're gonna interrupt the transmission line right over here and continue on with the same transmission line Z0. And that's gonna be connected to some unknown load ZL where again, ZL could be a mix of resistors and capacitors and inductors. Now at this interruption point, we're gonna add a shunt. And a shunt is basically going to be a direct connection between the two portions of this transmission line and we'll have an impedance of ZS. And this shunt ZS is going to be specifically a distance D away from the load, all right? Now let's examine, our goal right here is to try to get this input impedance right here. We want this Z in to equal Z, uh, Z zero, right? If Z in observed right here, right before the shunt equals Z zero, then we've got a match. Right, so that's our goal. Now Z in as shown right there is gonna be the sum of two things. The first is going to be some of this transmission line impedance, right? Z in two, right? It's the input impedance ignoring the stub, only looking at the last segment of the transmission line with the load at the end. In parallel with that shunt value, Zs. In other words, it's equal to the product divided by the sum. It's Z in two, I left out the two right there. It's Z in two, let me keep the color scheme the same. All right, this equals Z in two times Zs divided by Z into plus Cs, right, the product over the sum. And so now we've got a couple parameters that we can tune to get this right. Uh, we can fit, we can change the, the, the value of D, we can change the value of Zs, uh, and I guarantee you um, within those that two parameter space, you'll find something that works that produces this condition that uh, Zn, um, equals Z zero, right? And so all you gotta do is find a value of D and ZS that makes this work. Uh, as before, the, uh, um, the match here is only going to work at a single frequency, all right? So uh, again, you can figure out what the reflection coefficient is. This ZN is going to be a function of frequency. And so you will, you will only get a perfect match at one spot, all right? Now, just to remind you that the formula for ZN2 is the same formula that we considered in the earlier portions of this lecture. It's equal to Z0 times ZL plus J, Z0 times tangent of beta D, divided by Z0, that's the zero there, Z0, plus J Z L tangent of beta D, right? This, oh, I put Z in two there. This two should be on the bottom. This Z N two is the impedance of the transmission line um, that has a load Z L, but you've walked away by D meters away from the transmission line, away from that load with the transmission line Z0 in between. And this is the impedance that you get. So there is a solution to this. You can arbitrarily search. Uh, a quicker way to do this is actually to use a Smith chart because you start out with the value on the Smith chart of ZL divided by Z0. And then as you increase the line D, 
you are you're you're transiting around in a circle on the uh, um, on the Smith chart in the clockwise direction, and then you land somewhere, and you can figure out the parallel combination with zs that gives you a value of uh, z zero. All right, so that's called shunt matching. I'm going to show you two other techniques. And they are similar to basically a different strategy and a different geometric structure. Uh, this next one is called parallel stub matching. All right, and the idea is this. Here's our transmission line. It has intrinsic impedance Z0. And here, we're going to interrupt the transmission line right here. And we're going to interrupt it a distance D0 from the load. All right, so the load has a value ZL. We're going to interrupt the transmission line a distance Z0. And at that point, we're going to put a stub. Get this out of the way just so I can draw it in. And we're going to draw the stub like this. The stub is going to be another transmission line. The transmission line will have length D1. And the transmission line will terminate in an open circuit. And we're going to connect the transmission line like this. Right? This will be connected in parallel. And this bottom one here, I'll try to draw this whoop, up over there and we'll connect that in parallel. So this transmission line right here also has intrinsic impedance C0. This is a, uh, a, um, a parallel fan out in that you've got one transmission line of Z0, which then fans out into two parallel lines, each with impedance C0. One of them takes us to the load. The other one goes on and ends in, in nothing, in an open circuit, right? Now, this is almost incredible if you take a look at it because how would just adding an empty line that goes to nothing create a match, right? And it's remarkable, but if you go through um, the, uh, the, the logic here, it kind of works. So let's consider this impedance right here, and we'll call it Z in zero, right? This is the input impedance looking into transmission line uh, of, of the stub toward the load, uh, but just after the, uh, the stub. And let's consider this right here, We'll call this Z in one. And Z in one is just gonna be the impedance looking into this open circuit. And uh, this, this uh, line has a distance D one, right? Now Z in, we know what that is. Z in one uh, will reduce to the impedance of a transmission line that has an open circuit on the end, which is um, negative J, times Z zero times the cotangent of beta D. All right, that was the um, equation that we uh, wrote down earlier. All right, so, so we know that. Um, and this Z in zero, we can write out the full equation, the Z in zero equals Z zero times uh, that longer equation before. And so in order for this to match, all we need is for Z in one parallel, Z in zero must equal Z zero. If we make this condition true, we'll have a perfect match. Again, only at one frequency, but it is a perfect match. And it turns out there are values of D zero and D one that make this condition true and give you a perfect match. When that happens, you do not have a perfect match along this transmission line D0 or along this transmission line D1. In both of those places, you'll have standing waves, you'll have echoing wave back and forth. But in this main transmission line, you'll only have a positive going wave. The negative going wave will be zero, right? And this is called parallel stub matching. The last one is gonna be pretty similar. Uh, this is called a series stub. And you can probably take a guess of what that's going to look like already. All right, here's a transmission line. It 
C0. We're going to have this line right here. Same transmission line. You can just cut a piece of cable, and that's your transmission line. We'll, we'll, we'll call that C0. Um, and so we're interrupting this main transmission line in the following way. All right, and we're going to connect this as a, uh, a series fan out. And so uh, this first uh, transmission line will basically connect through Z0, and this will proceed onwards. All right, let's uh, draw out the input impedances. This input impedance right here, we call this uh, Zn0. That's the impedance looking into uh, this line that has length of D0 and has a load of ZL. And this transmission line has length of D1. We can make this more general. This impedance does not have to be Z0, it can be Z1. And we'll define this input impedance, Zn1, to be the impedance looking into this, uh, this stub right here that, again, ends in an open circuit. And it, by the way, it can end in a short circuit, in which case um, you can just repeat the same math, just use the short circuit in line instead of open circuit, but it still works either way. And in order for this to work and produce no match, all we need to do is ensure that Z0 equals Zn0 plus Zn1, right? And this is called series stub matching. Okay. Now, this is a really powerful technique if you think about it, right? Because one way you could have these stubs is by having a transmission line that sort of, you know, goes out a meter away and then just stops, right? That's a stub. But think about this on a circuit board, right? On a circuit board or on an integrated circuit where you don't have control over your load and you don't have control over your transmission line impedance, but you know you're operating in a narrow band of frequencies. You could have traces that jut off from your main trace and just go off in the distance and stop right there. That's a very easy thing to do on a circuit board or on an integrated circuit. And just that simple technique if you design the geometry correctly, can give you a perfect match, right? It's an incredibly remarkable and powerful technique. Uh, and what this, what this uh, comes down to is the Smith chart is actually a very powerful way to figure this out graphically. Because if you consider this, um, we wanna get to the Z0 equals Zn2 plus Zn1. All right, this stub right here, Zn1, is going to be a purely imaginary number. All right, so think about it this way. We're looking at the Smith chart and we start out with our value of ZL. We can spin around the Smith chart until we find a value of D0 that gives us the real part of Zn0 equals Z0, right? That the real parts match, um, but we're still left with this imaginary component to this input impedance. And because this is series stub matching is very easy, all we need to do is ensure that Z in one is equal and opposite, right? So basically the imaginary part of Z in zero is the negative imaginary part of Z in one. So basically you can start with the Smith chart. Let me back up and show you. You can start with the Smith chart and you can traverse along the Smith chart. Uh, wavelengths toward generator is where we're going. So let's say you start out right here, right? You basically traverse along the uh, um, Smith chart until you reach this point right here. At this point, we now have the, the real part of the impedance matching up perfectly, but we've got some imaginary components. Uh, then we can design Okay. then we can design this C1 stub to perfectly cancel out that remaining imaginary portion. And, the, and then we're left with this perfect condition of Zn1 um, plus Zn2 equals Z0. So again, very powerful technique. Um, sliding things along the Smith chart is a much quicker way 
graphically to figure it out than to actually crunch the numbers on that ZN equation. Uh, in this course, we won't actually be requiring you to understand the Smith chart, but it's useful to know that it's there um, and, and know how to use it in general. Okay, so um, by the way, we can, we can cascade any of these techniques, um, can sort of stack on top of each other. Um, the techniques that we've used to sort of um, uh, slide an input impedance along, uh, we can extend that as well. So for example, let's say we have a scenario where we have a source. connected to a transmission line, which then changes to another transmission line, which then changes to another transmission line. Let's say this just keeps cascading like this. And let's say these all have different impedances, Z3, Z2, Z1, right? And these all have different lengths too. This has length D3, this has length D2, this has length D1, right? This could go on and on in a long chain, potentially. And if we want to ask the question of what is the input impedance seen here looking in, then we can always figure that out by starting at the load, ZL, and one step at a time, sort of transiting our way to the left. So we can figure out what this input impedance is here, right? Z in one will be equal to Z one times uh, Z L plus J C1 tangent of beta D. Make that a little bigger and clear. Tangent of beta D divided by C1 plus CL times tangent of beta D. All right, so that will be the impedance seen at this juncture looking to the right. But let's take this one step further. Now we're gonna step out to this section right here and ask what is the impedance at this junction between lines two and three looking toward the load. So what we basically can do is treat this entire latter part of the circuit as if it were a load, right? So we're gonna take this entire thing right here and collapse it. And it's going to look like a load that has value of Z in one. Let me make that bigger. It has value of Z in one to it. So this uh, value Z in two will be equal to Z two times what looks like the load on the other side, which is Z in one plus J z2 tangent of beta d divided by z2 plus j c in one tangent of beta d and we can carry this on one more step as well where everything to the left of this point or sorry to the right of this point can be thought of as if it were a single load with value Z in two, right? And we can sort of step through and figure out uh, what is the impedance that's facing the, um, the generator. Uh, and once you do that, you can sort of set conditions and, uh, and try to minimize reflections as best you can for, for uh, sort of any arbitrary scenarios. Now this, this circuit diagram that I've drawn is actually pretty realistic if you think about this in a context of say a circuit board. Right. In a circuit board, you have ground planes in certain sections and some places, some sections don't have ground planes. You may have wires that have to cross underneath wires or maybe they change to a different layer. Uh, every time that happens, the geometry changes and therefore the impedance of the transmission line changes. So this setup that I just drew is very realistic in a complicated circuit board or in a complicated integrated circuit. But 
in dealing with you know small ranges of frequencies or RF or AC applications, you can always figure out what the impedance is in by starting at the load and working your way backwards toward the source. All right, so that completes this uh, lecture video where we've now talked about uh, how any sort of load on a uh, sinusoidally varying transmission line, um, how we get voltages and currents propagating and how we get different impedances, and most importantly, uh, how we match the, the loads to impedances for cases where we don't have control over the transmission line geometry um, and can't perfectly match the load to the line. In the next lecture video, we're going to consider the scenario where the lines are not perfect, where there is some loss of the line. So at this point, we've considered that if I send one volt down the transmission line, I can count on that one volt wave staying perfectly flat, exactly one volt all the way down. The phase changes, but the amplitude doesn't. Real transmission lines are not like that. They have a little bit of attenuation. And the next video, we're going to add that into the math and see how it changes things.